Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to New Books Network. I'm Karina Limorenko, doctoral candidate in neuroscience with a focus on biochemistry and molecular biology of neurodegenerative diseases at the BFL in Switzerland, and will be your host today. Today, we'll be talking to Helga Nowotny about the new book, In AI We Trust, Power, Illusion, and Control of Predictive Algorithms. One of the most persistent concerns about the future is whether it will be dominated by the predictive algorithms or of AI. And if so, what this will mean for our behavior, for our institutions, and for what it means to be human. As we try to adjust to a world in which algorithms, robots, and avatars play an ever-increasing role, we need to understand better the limitations of AI and how to predict how their predictions affect our agency while at the same time having the courage to embrace the uncertainty of the future. Well, Helga, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to have you here with us today. So I would like to start by asking, how has pandemic influenced you and your work, and maybe some main takeaways that you have gathered from this experience? Well, it influenced me by reinforcing the importance of the topic, because I had been thinking about AI and predictive algorithm for some time. And then when the pandemic hit, I was really taken aback because I felt myself now, you know, in the in the midst of what was happening. And as many of us experienced, on the one hand, all the digital technologies that surround us were kind of lifesavers or safety boys, whatever you want to call them, because um, they got us out of isolation. I mean, we cannot imagine even what these various lockdowns would have been like without digital technologies. And on the other hand, it showed uh, very clearly the importance of having um, our bodies in the real world and not just in the digital world. And if you move too much into the digital world, it does something with your body and your body resents it. So this was um, a kind of interesting personal experience also, working on a topic and then you feel it, the way how it impacts you. Otherwise, you know, like many people working in academia, we were in a very privileged position um, because um, we had space at home. We were used to work at home. So this was nothing new for us. And uh, of course, like many others, you know, I also used the time for, for writing. So from this point of view, I can only say it had its uh, advantageous sides for me as well. But I also participated in a book project that uh, came out. Uh, This was uh, Gerard Delanti, who was the editor, Pandemics, Politics and Society. So I was also in touch with other um, authors, colleagues who were contributing to the book during that period which made also for an interesting um, scholarly exchange on what we were experiencing. You yourself, how did you find adjusting to lack of travel, perhaps? Well, you know, on on the personal side, because I was separated from my partner for three months, because travel was virtually, crossing borders was virtually impossible. And so this was the hard part. But then we found ways of um, filling out uh, travel forms. And, uh, you know, we became rather experts in which travel forms you had to fill out uh, to be able to cross borders. So that was the hardest part for me. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Well, um, let let me start with uh, my present position. As you know, I am a professor emerita of ETH Zurich, so not very far from where you are now. And I'm also the former president of the European Research Council. 
And uh, I remain, of course, very uh, much uh, attached to the years that I spent building up the uh, European Research Council. Unfortunately, as you know, Switzerland is in a limbo now and does no longer participate. I hope that uh, it will be resolved one way or the other, but in, in, in a good way for uh, Swiss researchers. So this is <clears throat> where I am right now. I'm also... Um, the chair or member of a number of scientific advisory boards. Um, so I keep in touch with the academic world around me. I always have been also interested and engaged in policy work. So this continues. Um, and otherwise, um, I try to uh, make sense of, uh, you know, what technology does with us and what we do with uh, technology. And digital technologies are fascinating from this point of view because it's a very potent and a very um, rapidly developing uh, new technology that really pervades all uh, of our, all facets of our life. It's uh, the, the personal life, uh, if you think of fitness bands, uh, you know, and monitoring not only our physiological parameters, but also um, there are algorithms and sensors that try to measure the mood we are in. And uh, from, so from the personal side, uh, you can clearly see how much we accept, appropriate, uh, these technologies, but also how they invade our personal life. And I was um, always taken a bit aback when I heard people say, you know, by now the algorithm knows me better than myself. And I thought, no, I don't want any algorithm to know myself better than I do myself. But um, this is just one example how much it, um, it, it has become part of our personal life. And then, of course, um, you can clearly see what happens in, uh, in, in, in the workplace, although their um, you know, developments are still very much in progress, but we can see also um, <clears throat> how quickly professional work is becoming um, invaded by um, algorithms with by AI, how it changes the workplace. It's not just the automation of factories that has been going on for many years, of course, but also um, the way how science works. Um, we have some fantastic new tools in science. If you think of protein folding, um, when I think back of my time at ETH uh, Zurich, you know, this was one of the hot uh, topics uh, by one of my colleagues in the natural sciences. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all over the place. And um, therefore, you know, I, I find it fascinating trying to make sense. Um, what does it do to us and what do we do with it? The problem I faced um, is that there is an enormous amount of literature. And the literature I found um, is divided. Uh, you have on the one side, all these utopian or nerd-like celebrations. It will solve all of our problems. Um, it's innovation, it's the disruptive technology that we have been looking for and it will solve all our problems. And on the other side, you have the dystopian camp, if I can call it that, of uh, people who are warning. Um, I mean, if you think of uh, Shoshana Tsubo's uh, book, uh, Surveillance Capitalism, that made quite an impact because she showed in detail how much um, this um, collusion between uh, users giving up their data and even very intimate data to the large corporations for the sake of convenience. You know, you get services, you get um, the information very quickly, you get um, the recommendations that you're looking for, etc. On the other hand, um, the, the specter of surveillance beat, beat by the state, which is always possible, um, or by companies, and um, so I had to find a way 
um, not to fall into this trap uh, of a polarization, you know, the utopian views and dystopian views, because I think we have to overcome this kind of uh, dichotomous uh, thinking. So this was um, where, where, in a way, where I started. Then I, you know, I went to conferences, I talked to people working with AI, um, etc. And then I got uh, really fascinated by uh, predictive algorithms. And since I have been working before in my previous um, professional life, I've been always working uh, on the topic of time and the future and how our concept of the future changes. So this became one entry point. And the other entry point, um, which is somehow connected with this, is the topic of uncertainty. I, I wrote a book just five or six years ago, The Cunning of Uncertainty, where um, I tried to um, deconstruct uh, uncertainty. And, just, you know, it's not just something that we have to be afraid of, quite to the contrary. Uh, we have to learn how to live with uncertainty, and it has many positive sides. So this all came together, and then um, I started writing, um, and the pandemic helped me in having time to concentrate and to focus. So your latest book, In AI We Trust, Power, Illusion, and Control of Predictive Algorithms. So you already explained how you approached it. So why did you, what did you want to achieve in it? Well, I wanted, um, as the subtitle says, I wanted to show um, where does the, its power come from? Why do we um, allow it to have this power uh, over us? Uh, but then also, um, of course, um, is thinking about the illusions that we think we can now control better our future, that we can uh, predict or our future is predicted for us, um, and uh, of course, how to, how to manage it. And at, at the heart of my book is um, what, what I call a paradox, because predictive um, algorithms Uh, allow us to increase um, control over uncertainty and over the future because it allows us to see further. But at the same time, we attribute agency to these uh, predictive algorithms. We treat them as though um, they can actually predict while what they do is to extrapolate from, from the past, but somehow you know, we get the feeling they know the future or they know us, what we will do in the future better than us. And uh, this um, transfer of agency makes us act in ways in which the algorithm predicts, and that reduces our agency. So this is a somewhat lengthy explanation, but I think the gist of the paradox is on the one hand, it lets us see further, but if we believe that the algorithm has too much power, it, that it can actually predict the future, which is not the case. If we forget, forget about probabilities uh, in which all these predictions are couched, then we relinquish uh, agency. So this is what I try uh, to show. And then, of course, there are many other um, uh, sort of facets or dimensions to it. Uh, I became interested in um, the, the origins. I became interested in the coincidence with the Anthropocene. I have one a chapter on the mirror world that we are creating and uh, how we move in this mirror world. And also... Um, One, uh, one chapter that is entitled um, Future Needs Wisdom. And uh, this uh, title was taken from a haiku that I wrote when I was coming back from a, from a conference. Um, this is a little story uh, which may be of interest also to our listeners. This was a conference where the organizers decided to have an AI write haikus for the different uh, breakout groups. 
Um, and instead of saying this is group A, B, C, and D, uh, each group got a different haiku, and the haiku was composed uh, by an algorithm, which is very easy. And I think the first haiku was already produced in the 70s. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's not something very spectacular, but so we got these haikus. And my haiku did not make a lot of sense to me. So in the, uh, on my way back, I was sitting in the plane and I thought, well, uh, I also want to write a haiku. If the AI can do it, I can perhaps do it better. And the last line of my little haiku was, future needs wisdom. And this was a line that uh, somehow uh, stuck with me. And then I made it uh, the title of a chapter where I speak also about ethics and things of this kind. So this is a very brief overview of um, what, what the book um, is, is about and what it contains. So let's delve into some of the concepts that you cover in your book. And let me start with the easiest one. So what is an AI well, I, you know, I use um, digitalization, AI, machine learning, deep uh, learning, uh, neural, neural networks as a kind of umbrella uh, term. So uh, there are, of course, the technical um, uh, definitions. Uh, we don't have to go into them. But I think um, th the way how I treat it is as an ensemble where it all comes together. We need um, infrastructures, digital infrastructures for it to make, uh, to, to work at all, to be able to operate. Um, we need um, computational power. We need um, ever more sophisticated algorithms that need to be trained. Even some are not trained and learn by themselves, but uh, others need to be trained. And for this, we need data. So the three most important components are data, algorithms, and computational power. So the question is, um, you know, how fast can an algorithm come up with uh, solutions that you have to um, predefine? Of course, you have to, to tell the algorithm what, you, what uh, kind of solutions you're looking for, um, but you need data. And now there is an enormous amount of data available of, of different kinds, uh, et cetera. And I'm, of course, particularly interested in the kind of data that come from the social world, uh, from the way how people behave, the kind of data they give to the large companies, and how this um, acts upon us and um, makes us then behave in certain ways, where these algorithms um, and their predictions can become uh, self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, and then people start to behave in the way how the prediction, um, you know, tells them to behave. And um, this is a well-known phenomenon in, in, in sociology. It's, it's known since um, the 1940s of the last century. Um, and uh, now, you know, we are surrounded by, um, by these algorithms. And so what is AI? I, I would say, you know, it's a, it's a very powerful technology that is made up of um, the, these different component parts, uh, data computation, power, algorithm, and of course, the people who design and, and operate them. Let's not forget them. Uh, it's not um, technology, it's never technology alone. And um, it's, it's, it's people, and uh, there are users, there are owners, there are companies, there's the state. And uh, when, you, when we speak and think about ethics, the question of regulation comes up, who regulates it, et cetera. So it's, it's a kind of very complex ensemble. And more and more, we understand that it's a very intimate dance between humans and technology as we move forward, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, the, the word dance is, is, is a very nice way. Um, the question is, you know, who sets the music, who sets the tone? And um, with the dance, you have someone who leads, someone who follows, but you also have creative forms of dancing. 
So um, the, the term I use is, is that of co-evolution, because I think in the long term, we get more and more um, into some kind of entanglement with these technologies. I mentioned already uh, fitness bands. Uh, so, you know, there are people who go to sleep uh, with, uh, with them, uh, with the sensors, and they never uh, think they should let the sensors um, <clears throat> off their bodies at some point. So it's this kind of intimate relationship um, that they enter. But we also have um, the the kind of uh, co-evolution, if you think of robots, and robots are not only the ones, um, you know, the social robots that look more or less like humans, or they want to try to look, but they should not look too much like humans, but also there are tiny little robots um, inserted into our bodies, for instance, to deliver drugs uh, to organs, etc. So all this is part of how we incorporate this technology into our body on the surface, but also in our body and, of course, around us, if you think of the environment. And um, by now, we have uh, very powerful sensors in satellites, in drones, etc., that are able to monitor, they are also able to kill, uh, as we know, autonomous weapons is one of the most uh, dangerous developments in this field. Um, but we can also use them to look, for instance, how far has um, deforestation uh, progressed in certain parts of the world, uh, etc. So, um, and so it's in us, it's with us, it's between us, but it's also in our environment. And this is why I speak about eco-evolution. And it's an open-ended process, like uh, evolution is, is open-ended. So how does the digitization differ across the world? Do some cultures have it in slightly different ways, how they perceive it? Yes, I mean, one striking example is social robots um, in Japan. Uh, Japan started very early in the field of robotics, and perhaps because uh, they were one of the earliest society that uh, was an aging society, so the society not reproducing themselves. And since Japan is not an immigration-friendly country, um, so the aging society was felt very early on. And uh, there are various ideas why in, in Japan these robots are accepted socially. They are treated uh, some, uh, something in the middle between a member of the family and a pet, and the pet is a member of the family, etc. So this is one cultural exception. Um, while in many other cultures, um, you know, people hesitate. Uh, they think that social robots to take care of the elderly, for instance, is something that dehumanizes um, um, elderly people, etc. And so there are these cultural differences. But I also see differences across the world that are related to to, to, to politics and the way how state and industry function, if you think of the way how um, AI is regulated. And here we have the US where state regulation is um, not very uh, favorably looked upon. Uh, you have very strong lobbies against reg state regulation with the argument this stifles innovation. So it will you know, undermine um, the, also the dominance that American companies, uh, the big ones like Microsoft, Google, etc., have in the world. Um, you have China where the state sets the rules and the state regulates 
everything, including facial recognition, uh, etc., social credit uh, that um, still does not quite work the way it, 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 uh, the government wants it to work, but nevertheless. And the EU or Europe trying somewhere in the middle with the Data Protection um, Regulation Act and the new AI Act. So I think regulation also shows um, it's it's partly, of course, you can say culture, but it's also a lot that has to do with the way how politics um, looks and appropriates and works with this AI or allows um, in, in Europe, we always appeal to the European values. So facial recognition um, is looked upon as something that is to be avoided, uh, etc. And the more a liberal or libertarian economic attitude that you find in, in the US. And what are the bigger ethical debates that surround AI? Well, uh, you know, you cannot start a debate on AI without um, ethics coming up as a topic. And uh, everyone thinks that ethics is the solution. The problem is we don't have an agreement on what kind of ethical AI we want, what is technically feasible, because it's not so easy, um, but also how it will be implemented, updated, etc. And there was an interesting study that was done by a group at ETH Zurich, um, looking at official documents, um, almost 100 official documents, half of them coming from governments on guidelines for ethical AIs and the other half by corporations. And uh, what was found that they, you had no agreement in these almost 100 documents, which principles make an AI an ethical AI. And the one principle that came closest in something like 50 or 60 um, uh, of these guidelines was that of transparency. Um, but, uh, you know, it shows the enormous difficulties. We all want an ethical AI, but it shows the difficulties. What do we mean by transparency? How do you make sure the transparency can actually be embedded and technologically embedded, which is, of course, um, otherwise it's useless, can be monitored. And then, as with every regulation, you always have the problem, how do you update it? Because the technology becomes more sophisticated, the technology can circumvent what uh, you know the, the lawmaker or the ethicists want. Um, so we have an enormous ongoing debates there, um, which, of course, is necessary. But on the other hand, um, we have very little agreement and we have not made that much progress, I would say. And this is why I came up with this idea. Maybe we need uh, wisdom. And by wisdom, <clears throat> uh, I, I mean that we have to look much more into the social context in which uh, the AI is being used, in which is, for which it is being designed, where it is being used, and also the way how people use it. So it sounds like it's a matter of really differentiating of what kind of performance AI is built for. So, for example, if it's manufacturing or social robot or cleaner robot, they would have different sort of approaches to how they can be regulated. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, this means to go in the social context. And um, this is um, the kind of attitude, the ethos that, that I think needs to be um, uh, adopted if we want to, uh, you know, be able to somehow come closer to the feeling um, we can put at least some of our values, some of the ideas that we have, what should be done, what should not be done into this technology, rather than just letting it run wild 
or let the, the, the big companies decide uh, on what they deem to be acceptable or not. So what are the some AI developments that really excite you nowadays? Well, I, I, I follow very closely um, developments in science. And there, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's great. And if you think now of the James Webb um, Space Telescope, you know, it's, it's just amazing what we are able to do to send this telescope um, to look for the origins of uh, galaxies uh, millions of light years away. All this would be impossible without AI. So this is just you know, my enthusiasm <laughs> is being excited by this because I, I, I find it really uh, amazing. But uh, closer to um, everyday concerns, um, what, uh, what is interesting is also the way how, um, you know, people try to, um, find, to find their own way um, and here you have youngsters who are enthusiastic about the technology, but at the same time, some become critical. We have all these ongoing discussions about fake news, the social media, etc., where fake news per se are nothing new, but they circulate very widely. So all these are, let's say, ambivalent, um, you know, developments that um, make life um, challenging, interesting. Um, and uh, I think it really poses the question to us, um, how are we re- defining what makes us human. So where do you see field progressing from here? Well, um, you know, going, uh, the, the progress um, that I, I, I see, on, I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, the development is really a very fast uh, development um, everywhere. And, um, it's difficult to make any predictions, as I, I said, but where I see and I hope that AI will be able to uh, support efforts is in the area of the environment and, and, and climate change. Um, we need um, good models, um, and here AI can help us in order to understand better these very complex uh, systems. If you think of uh, the interactions between atmosphere and oceans and how they impact the climate, um, et cetera. So here I would say it's an enormous uh, field in which AI, where AI is very much needed and where we face enormous challenges and urgency to do something. So this, I would say, is something that I, I hope that um, we will have um, a good use of AI in, in this area. So do you think we also need a better education of people about AI? Definitely. I mean, um, critical thinking, um, how to use it, and critical thinking um, in, in terms not just of understanding, because technology can be understood um, only up to a certain degree because uh, it's in a black box uh, still. But uh, for young people, I think it's important to, to teach them how to ask uh, critical questions and critical thinking. But then I think also it offers some interesting new ways of involving people by um, letting them participate in simulation models. Um, simulation models make predictions, but the predictions are based on the assumptions, what if? And this is something that people, that everyone can understand. You make certain assumptions, so they can be very simple, and then you see what will be the outcome. And this is something that you can bring to, to people, um, you know, down to 
the the everyday level if you have um you know in in, in urban uh, design or if you have um questions about um the the environment a little bit of citizen science in in this direction um you can get people to understand given certain assumptions you will have certain consequences you never will know all the consequences but certain ones you can see with certain probabilities and i think this would be a very important educational tool also both in schools but also for people you know everyday uh, life where you can find out when what if and um many many people we see this also now with the with the, in in the pandemic and all the discussions about vaccinations many people don't understand what are probabilities yeah and then people say yes but i know someone who has been three times vaccinated and the person got sick or the person died yeah then you say, well, there is no 100% uh, assurance of anything in the world. So I think to, to use simulation models and the what-if constellation would be a very valuable educational tool. And the question on many people's mind nowadays is, should we, should we be fearful of AI? What would be our answer? Well, uh, fear is never a good, <laughs> a good strategy, I would say. You know, fear pushes you back into a corner where you want to protect yourself against a force that you find overpowering. So uh, I don't think we have to be afraid of it, um, but we have to, um, to, to be able... Um, when I speak about in the, the title in AI, uh, we trust, it's of course a word play of in God we trust, as you know, this is uh, the, the American uh, motto written on, on the dollar. Um, but at the same time, it's a bit tongue in cheek because we should not trust it too much. So on the one hand, uh, yes, um, we, we can trust it, but at the same time, we should not trust it too much. And uh, to find this, um, this line that has to be negotiated and renegotiated, I think this is, is, is one of the messages that I would like to, to send out with the book. Now, thinking about the bigger picture, and you already mentioned uh, some of it, so do you think AI will be integral for, to our ability to solve some of the biggest problems and challenges for the future? Definitely. I, th I think it has an enormous potential for that. But, um, you know, again, we have uh, to be careful not to believe um, there are only technological fixes. Because these are shortcuts and the technology will never exist to solve all of our environmental problems. So again, we have to um, ask our question, the, the, to ask ourselves the question: In which way can we use AI to monitor, to ask, um, to put it into simulation models? Which data are we using? We have to start to work with it and uh, to work carefully with it instead of being afraid. And um, therefore. I think the potential is enormous to help us because it allows us to see further. But we never should forget uh, this depends on the data that come from the past. We don't have data from the future. The data are from the past. We need high quality data. This is also something that politicians, decision makers uh, have to learn. Um, and... Um, you know, data are an important part of, of it, but we need uh, to look at the quality, just as with food, you know, we don't want to eat anything. We want to have high quality food. So we need also high quality data. And what discoveries along your journey to writing your book in AI with Trust surprised you the most? I was um, surprised um, to discover the ease or naivete with which people believe the predictions of an AI. 
and it reminded me of um, the times when people were using oracles. You know, in every civilization in the history of humankind, um, um, there were priests or shamans or uh, divinatory practitioners using oracles to make predictions. And uh, somehow the, the way how people approach the predictions of AI reminded me of this magic uh, past or belief in magic that, uh, that humans had in the past. Why now we think, well, you know, we are uh, all um, highly developed uh, technological scientific civilization, so we have left magic behind us. But uh, I was surprised a bit of these residues is still very much alive. Such an important point that with, as with any new technology, we should approach it with some pragmatism and skepticism. Absolutely. I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine that you could have any sci-fi AI. What would it be? Well, I don't think I'm a good sci-fi writer, but there are some sci-fi writers that I think very highly of, and one is Ursula Le Guin. And uh, she, uh, she's no longer alive, but she was a great uh, writer. And what she tried with her writing is to enlarge the imagination but the imagination with a purpose of how can we build a better society. And so if I were only half as gifted as Ursula Le Guin, you know, I would uh, try to write uh, sci-fi in order to, um, you know, unleash our imagination. What would a better society look like and how could we ever get there. Well, this has been a really insightful, insightful discussion. So can you tell us what are you currently working on and what will be your next project? Well, um, you know, once you finish a book, you don't want to immediately uh, embark on the next one. But of course, there are uh, ideas and concerns and interesting problems. And they turn around the Big, big uh, question, how can we understand societal transformations? We are now in the second year of this pandemic and we experience there is no return back to the life as it was before. There are transformations that uh, have shown us um, the deep inequalities in society. They have shown us um, cleavages in society that we never, you know, thought of that they existed, etc. And um, there are interesting other transformations going on uh, towards, uh, you know, the green transformation, etc. And um, we have a personal experience of this. We have also model modeling, a complex um, uh, systems modeling, but we understand very little how do these processes actually work. So this is a big question and I'm just standing at the beginning of it and, and trying to um, perhaps um, do a little bit more in, in, in this direction. And what would be the best way for our listeners to find more information about your work and also your book? Well, um, go to my homepage, uh, which is easy to find. And um, for, for the book, you, you, you just Google it and um, it's, it's, it's available. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And uh, I very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you.